Well, good morning, everyone. If you want to find Hosea in chapter 14. <laughs> Hosea chapter 14. We're at the end of Hosea, and Lord willing, next Sunday we'll begin the book of Joel. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day morning, and thank you we can be out in, at church here with your people, and Lord, we pray that you would meet with us and bless today in a great way. Father, please honor your word, and, and Lord, now we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to, to be receptive and responsive in a positive way to what you had to say through your prophet Hosea many years ago as he spoke to address the problems among your people back then and Lord we know that in a basic way people haven't changed in all these thousands of years and neither of you and Lord the same issues in principle that were present then or are present today and Father, we thank you for your great love and, Lord, for how you manifested that in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, pray you'd help us to exalt him here today. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we'll read the chapter and then we'll get started. It says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord, saying to him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. <coughs> I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as a dew unto Israel. He shall grow as a lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be as the olive tree. His smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. For me is thy fruit found. Who is wise, and he shall understand these things? Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them. But trans the transgressors shall fall therein. So not a long chapter, and uh, as we say, a conclusion to this prophecy. As we saw in verse 1, begins with the final call from Hosea to the northern ten tribes to return to the Lord. So throughout this prophecy, remember, there's been several occasions where God has reached out to the Israelites and their rebellion and sin to, to come back. He once again sets forth the Israelites the truth that the nation in reality has only one God. Remember back in chapter 13, you know, in spite of all their looking to idols and looking to other nations and looking to themselves, in reality, there's only one God and only one that can take care of them and and get them through whatever the needs they have. There have been no other gods that have taken care of them throughout the years since it became a nation but the Lord, whether they accepted that truth or not. And it's the same with us, you know, and people today. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that don't acknowledge God, yet God in His grace, common grace, you might say, has taken care of them and mercy has been extended to them. The reason for the fall of the northern ten tribes was due to the Israelites' iniquity, alvon, and it's from a base word meaning perversion or crooked behavior. And the word has the meaning or idea of the fact more than just the act that's done. It, it also carries with it the act if that act is worthy of, um, you know, some form of consequence. And, um, you know, often that's the way it is. And, um, you know, things are done contrary to God's will and God's word and you know there's a consequence on the back end of it and in this case um, you know their fall is due to you know their sin and their perversion and their turning away from uh, God's will the unconfessed sin and unrepentant attitude of Israel resulted in God's judgment 
you know, they refused many times to, to hear God's prophets and, and hear Hosea. And, you know, they suffered the consequences of, of that. Now, Hosea set before the Israelites five conditions they must fulfill before complete reconciliation could take place with God. And in many ways, these same principles are, you know, apply today, uh, if we think about it. First, he says uh, there, take with you words and turn to the Lord. And that's the idea there must be full acknowledgement of their sin, and there must be a genuine repentance towards God. You know, that's where it all starts. You know, there must be a recognition of, of our sin and our guilt before God. You know, until that takes place, you know, people don't realize that they have to uh, have any getting right with God. They don't acknowledge the fact that they've offended Him. The word turn, shub, means to return physically or to do something again or to carry back. In this case, it means to turn spiritually. So what can be applied in the physical realm can be applied in the spiritual realm. In other words, they were to turn back to God and to return to Him. And it implies that the nation must repent of their rebellion against God. They must agree with God concerning their spiritual condition as seen by Him. You know, it's getting God's perspective on things. You know, how God looks at you know, the heart and, and the condition of the heart. How God looks at the behavior is what matters. It's not man's perspective it's, that's important. Man needs to line his perspective up with God's perspective in this case. And, and uh, you know, where pastor preached about confessing our sin, it's acknowledging, God, you're right about me. <laughs> you know, I have done wrong. I have sinned against you. And that's what the, the idea is here. You know, um, getting in line with God's view of things. And there must be poverty of spirit. In other words, humbleness of heart rather than pride and arrogance. Remember we talked about the arrogance of Israel and their pride, their self-sufficiency. You know, all that gets all that gets broken, all that gets done away with. And we'll need, you know, that'll have to be present. And then there must be poverty of spirit before there can be reconciliation with God. In other words, a recognition of of the real need that, that's in our lives when it comes to God. There, you know, real restoration has to come from God. Real forgiveness has to come from God. And so that's where it all starts. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Next it says, Say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. There must be an acceptance of the fact that they were incapable of fixing their sin problem. And they must rely on God alone for cleansing and restoration of their sin. In the words, I can't, I can't make myself right with you. I can't do enough. I can't be enough to be accepted of God. You know, there must be a reliance on God and His grace in this matter. You know, the Israelites must understand that the performance of religious acts did not impress the Lord. And uh, you know, I give several scriptures there, and um, we'll read one or two. Some of them are probably more familiar. The one back in Samuel regarding King Saul and um, what the Lord really wants. And um, here Samuel confronting Saul says, "But the people took of the spoil." And sheep and oxen, the chief of the things that should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. You know, you know the Israelites could have sacrificed a million animals, and if it wasn't done with the right attitude of heart, you know, God wouldn't have mattered at all. God wouldn't have accepted it. You know, it doesn't impress the Lord. It might impress men, but it doesn't impress God. And then it talks about the contriteness of heart and humbleness of heart in some of these scriptures. And the word contrite, pulling from that, maybe I ought to read one and um, out of Isaiah to kind of set the stage for that. Isaiah 57 and 15. For thus saith the hath and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know, that's what God looks for in people. 
you know, his humbleness and, and brokenness before him. And the word contrite, dekal, means crushed or broken into small pieces or ground into dust. And it's the idea of, of truly being humble before God and uh, knowing that uh, the dependence totally is on the Lord. And it's an adjective form of the Hebrew word dekal which is used by the prophet Isaiah to describe what happened to Jesus Christ because of our iniquities. I found that very interesting, that um, you know, the same base word is used to refer to what took place to the Lord um, on our behalf. If you look in Isaiah 53 and 5, it said, For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. There's our term right there. He was bruised for our iniquities. In other words, he was crushed. He was, you might say, quote unquote, broken into pieces. He was humbled, you know, for our sin. And, uh, you know, not just himself physically, but, but I think his, his soul was uh, crushed and, and uh, brought under the weight of our sin. said, um, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And then over in verse 10 it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. There it is again. The same, same idea. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You know, Christ was, was bruised. He was crushed in our place. And, and he suffered what we should have suffered for our sin. I thought it was interesting. You have a... Uh, you know, the, a link between those two words. The same attitude that, that God wants in, in people's hearts is, is related to the way that, that Christ, uh, what happened to him because of our sin. It says, when Israel is reconciled to God, they're able to render the calves of their lips. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting term here. And uh, the word calves is, is par, and it means young bullock. And it's derived from the Hebrew word uh, parar, which means to break up and divide. And when that bullock was offered up, when that sacrifice was offered up, it was cut in pieces. And so that was the idea behind the, using the word par from another word means, which means to divide or to separate. And um, par is the primary word used in the Old Testament for the bullock that is being used for sacrifice. And so it's the sacrifice of their lips. And so the idea is instead of offering great numbers of sacrifices on altars to the Lord, remember back in chapter 5, verse 6, you know, it talked about that. Israel thought they would impress God with such a great number of sacrifices. But here they were to offer to him the sacrifice of their heartfelt praise. And um, that's what God wants, you know, from us is, is, is praise that really comes from the depths of our heart that's truly motivated by thanksgiving and, and worship and acknowledgement of who he is and you know in the new testament over in the book of hebrews uh the, it makes a, a direct reference to that it says by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to god continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name and so the expectation is that we you know, constantly praise the Lord. We constantly give him thanks for who he is and, and what he's done on our behalf. And so this aligns with what Hosea is saying here. Um, you know, they're to render the calves of their lips. They're to praise God and, and offer that up to God as a sacrifice. You know, God takes great delight in praise and thanksgiving offered up to him when it's motivated by the right attitudes of the heart. You know, God, I think, takes great delight in blessing people. And then I think in response, it pleases Him when we acknowledge that. And we recognize, hey, this blessing I have is from you, Lord, and, and I want to thank you for it. And, and uh, I recognize that uh, you're the one who's taking care of me and, and providing for me. And, um, and so that's what God wanted from the Israelites. And then if they did so in a genuine manner, it would be a reflection of the fact that they truly were repentant and, and that they had gotten themselves right with the Lord. 
Then in verse 3, it says, Asher shall not save us, and we will not ride upon horses. They must rely on God alone for deliverance and protection from their enemies. The Israelites must accept that other nations, such as Assyria, would be unable to save them from the problems. They must accept that weapons of war, such as horses and chariots purchased from Egypt, would be unable to save them in conflicts with other nations. And if you remember, that's one of the things that God uh, judged and was judging them for. You know, rather than looking to Him, they would look to Assyria. And rather than looking to Him, they would look to Egypt uh, for help that they, they needed. That was addressed several times in the prophecy. And, uh, you know, there is some other quotations there talking about that. You know, the Israelites, in particular the kings, had disobeyed God in this matter. You know, way back in the book of Deuteronomy, you know, there was a warning given by um, Moses regarding this very thing. And it was uh, behind it all, I think, is the principle of becoming... Um, self-dependent and, and thinking that you don't need God. And this we see, says, Thou shalt in any wise set him a king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren. Shalt thou set the king over thee? Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has sent unto you, ye shall henceforth return more that way. And so, you know, the leadership of the country, the kings in particular, were, were not to uh, build up for themselves, you know, great number of horses and, and chariots and so forth and so on. And, you know, the dependence was to be on God. It says, to rely on other nations or in their own military might was evidence of their lack of faith in the Lord. God called the nation or wanted the nation to call upon Him in times of trouble. There was a promise of His deliverance when they would do so. And, you know, in, in Psalm 50... In verse 15, God says, And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And so, for us, you know, when times get tough and, and things get hard, where do we turn? Who do we look to? Who do we rely on? And I think here we see that God wants us to look to Him and rely on Him and trust Him, just like the Israelites. Next we see, Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods. Israel must remove themselves from their idols and worship and serve God alone. Israel must realize the utter foolishness of trying to rely on some man-made idol or the false god that it represented for the issues of life. And so, remember here in this prophecy, as one of the things that Israel was plagued with was their involvement with idolatry. And that's what God is addressing and saying must take place. And here again, if they do so, and, and you can read these first verses that we've been reading through here kind of from Israel's perspective, saying, you know, we, we will do this, we will do this, and that would be evidence of true repentance on their part. And then the last phrase there in verse 3, For in thee the fatherless find mercy. Israel must realize that its only hope is in the Lord. Without God, the nation was compared to a small child that did not have a father figure in his, her life. During Hosea's day, a child in such a position was pretty much helpless and without protection, without provision, and without family identity, and without any real hope for the future. And so that's what the comparison is made to in, in Hosea's day. A child, a small child, you know, didn't have a father. God was had compassion on those that realize their helplessness and hopelessness and condition without Him, and gives to them a lasting hope regarding their future. And so, here we see the five things, the five conditions that was set before Israel that need to be put in place. You know, at some point in the future, Israel will not be referred to any longer as Lo Rama and Lo Ami. You know, the ones those you know who are not my child and and uh, you know one whom I have no pity on. You know, God will have compassion on them, and they once again be called His people. 
You and the nation as a whole will receive the Lord as their Messiah, and they'll be recipients of His mercy, and their relationship to Him will be fully restored. And you might say we've kind of come up almost a circle. If you remember back in, in chapter 1, <clears throat> In verses 10 and 11, it says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, You are not my people, there shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And so here we see, you might say, that uh, coming to pass on the part of the Israelites and maybe what they uh, will recognize and say at that time, just as God said it would be. And so some similarities, I think, very much to, to our days, the same attitude of heart, the same uh, thinking towards the Lord. You know, when we... Uh, realize that we've sinned and, and we need a Savior, we rely on what? On God's grace, aren't we? Totally and completely. And that's what Israel must, must do at that time. And at some point in the future, they will. And they'll realize and recognize Christ as their Messiah. Now, verses 4 through the first part of verse 5, Hosea reveals to the Israelites what God's response will be to when they humbly return to Him. You know, God won't turn the other way when they, they come humbly to them, will they? You know, God will respond in, in, the, in likewise in a positive way. He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. And so we see God's response to the change in Israel's heart. It says, God will heal their backsliding. You know, the word backsliding well, there means uh, refers to turning away or to being apostate, and that's what Israel was. You know, when they were worshiping idols, and you know they might have told people, you know, we're the people of God, you know, we're the nation of God, but in, in their behavior and in their in reality, you know, they were anything but that. And you know, it's like groups today that you know the Jehovah Witnesses. Unfortunately, they, they use the name Jehovah, but they don't have no relationship to Him. You know, the, the Church of Latter-day of Jesus uh, Christ, you know, uh, Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, you know, the Mormons. You know, they might claim to be a Christian, but in reality they have no relationship to Him. And so they're apostate. And, and um, so it's like it was Israel back in that day. One of the names for God is Jehovah Rapha, you know, the Lord that heals. And out of Exodus 15:26. It says, not only does he heal physical ailments, he heals emotional pain, he heals relationships, and he heals spiritually. In this case, he heals Israel, and will heal Israel. Uh, he'll heal their backsliding, and uh, he will cure the nation of its waywardness and its apostasy. You know, and, and praise God, at that time, it'll be a full-blown cure. <laughs> you know, that nation will never, will never again, you know, depart from the Lord. And... Uh, Next, God says he will love them freely. Netabal. It means a spontaneous and a, or an abundant attitude in giving. To give voluntarily without being compelled from without. And that's the way God's love is. And, you know, it's, when God loves people, it's not because of who the people are or what they are. It's because simply the fact God loves them. And it flows out of his heart. And uh, none of us are worthy of God's love. None of us, but he chooses to love us. And um, God's love for the Israelites will not be compelled by anything that they are at that time. God's love is more than just an emotion. It is what motivates him to act in the manner that he does. In John 3.16, God loved, but what did, what did that love result in him doing? Giving his son giving his son. God loves moves him to do things. God's love mo moves him to act really on the benefit and behalf of others. And uh, he certainly did for Israel. And he, he certainly has done that for us. You know, the Israelites had broken the covenant he had with them, yet he will heal, restore, and love them. God will bless, but not because he is in any way obligated to do so. At that time, God's anger at Israel due to the rebellion of sin will be abated and his judgment will turn to great blessing. And, you know, the, Israel, the future for Israel looks pretty good, you know, out in the future. And, uh, 
and it's the same way for us today. If you know Christ your Savior, the future looks pretty good. <laughs> and uh, you know, we can look forward to that. And, and when things get hard here, we need to, to let that be the thing that, that we keep in front of us, what He's promised for our future. Then it says, God will be as a dew unto Israel. As we said before, ancient Israel was an agrarian culture. You know, they relied heavily on you know what they grew out of the ground and, and you know their livestock. They weren't like some of the other nations around them. You know, some of the others were, were great trading nations and and relied a whole lot on commerce. But one as much with Israel, particularly early on. The strength of the nation's economy was inseparably linked to the magnitude of the harvest gathered to feed the people and the livestock. I think actually, you know, Israel was able to to sell some of the uh, grain and things that they grew to some of the neighboring nations that are traded with them for the things they needed because of of the uh, crops they grew. The dew that came after sunset provided vital moisture that refreshed and sustained the crops between periods of rain. In the future, the Lord will be like a refreshing and nourishing heavy dew to Israel. During the millennial kingdom, Israel will not only prosper materially, but importantly, the nation will prosper spiritually, all due to the Lord's blessing. And so it's more than just the, the physical due and the blessing will benefit from that. It's this, I guess you say, the spiritual due. God will bless them spiritually, and they will prosper spiritually and um, as a nation. And then the end of verse 5 on through verse 7, Hosea uses terms that the people recognize as representative of plant life that is prospering and is considered to be beautiful and desirable to the senses to describe Israel after the return of the Lord. You know, this will be the result that, that comes out of God's blessing, out of, out of Him being that dew, you might say. And so you have the picture of the crops and the things that, that uh, uh, come out of that blessing. You know, the millennial king will be a glorious time for Israel. Your know, lilies are fairly delicate flowers, which grow quickly and have beautiful blossoms that emit pleasing fragrances. You ever really look close at some of the blooms on a lily? And all the infinite and, and minute detail and color and things that's in those? Uh, you know, what a, what a wonderful thing God has made there if, if we just take time to look. However, the root system of lilies is not as strong as many other plants, meaning it cannot withstand severe weather conditions very well. You know, that's why this is picked here, I think, in verse 5. He shall grow as a lily and cast forth its roots as Lebanon. And so, trying to understand what the idea is here, in the future, the nature will have a root system associated with the cedars of Lebanon. You know, when the Bible scholars point to this particular uh, plant, as the, the cedars of Lebanon. And we see that in the Bible. Because of its roots, the cedars can grow to be massive trees. And I looked them up online, and they had pictures of those, uh, some of those cedars in Lebanon that wasn't the circumference around the trunk. The diameter of the trunk was eight feet. You know, the trees didn't grow very tall, but they were massive, and the trunks were. I don't know, did you see any of them when you was over Then, And... Uh, you know, I was kind of surprised. I always thought about maybe being tall and that type of thing. They didn't grow that tall, but they were just massive trees. And um, the cedars of Lebanon were prized for the beauty and strength and durability of the wood and were used in the construction of the temple. And you know, back in David's day and Solomon's, and I'm sure in Hosea's day, it was something that was uh, prized you know, for construction. During the millennial kingdom, Israel will become stable and strong. The nation will never be removed from its place again on the earth. You know, Ezekiel 37 talks about that. And the idea here is, you know, can you imagine a, a plant or, or something that has the beauty of a bloom of a lily and yet the strength of a cedar of Lebanon? That's the kind of idea behind what this nation will be, Israel will be, after God blesses it. You know, it will, will have the best, you might say, of both worlds in that regard. The nation is compared to a spreading olive tree, which is treasured for its beauty and the important fruit it bears. And there in verse 6, the olive tree is symbolic of spiritual vitality and holiness. The phrase, smell as Lebanon, is a reference to the pleasant aroma given off by the abundant wildflowers and evergreen trees that grew in that country. 
restored Israel will be, cons be a people considered to be pleasant and desirable to other nations and to the Lord. I think the idea is God's going to take away the reproach of Israel. You know, no longer will they be a, you know, the Bible, talk, Bible talks about being a byword and, and, and a reproach, you know, something that's looked down upon. I think God's going to elevate them and, and exalt them as a nation, as, as a people. And they'll be highly thought of rather than lowly thought of. Some Bible scholars believe that the first part of verse 7 pictures the Lord as a strong tree and is returning to find rest and refreshment in the Lord. There it says, And they that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine, and the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. <clears throat> it's just as a person might seek the coolness of the shade of a tree on a hot, sunny day. You know, I heard Ralph talking about the only air conditioning they had down in eastern North Carolina was the shade of a tree when he was growing up. <laughs> you know, and you know that's the way it was before we had air conditioning. You know, Oftentimes, people retired to a shady place in the heat of the day, and uh, so you can understand the picture. Others believe there's a reference to Israel being like a shade tree to the Jews who returned from all over the world to the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Either way, I think there's truth in, in, in both those thoughts. Due to the Lord's care and provision, the nation will flourish, just like grain and grapevines responded to the fertile soil, sufficient rain, and the good farmer's care. You know, that's kind of like God's blessing and God's care. And then as the nation as a whole prospers, so will each Israelite prosper as well. And, you know, what will be good for the nation will be good for ind the individual. And uh, Israel sent... Uh, will be like the wine of Lebanon. And here again, an interesting word, sin, is zikr, and refers to a, a memento, a memorial, a remembrance. And uh, you still smell things today, and when you smell them, it reminds you of something from years gone by. You know, you may remember the scent of, of, of being with your family at Thanksgiving and all the odors from the foods that are cooked and that type of thing. And so here's the idea here behind this word scent. You know, uh, the fragrance given off is a remembrance of something pleasant and something good uh, from a time before or somewhere else. And, uh, you know, that's often what comes to mind in those situations. The fragrance given off by the juice of the grapes grown in Lebanon was very pleasing and noteworthy. And it's something that, that people took uh, note of, you know, if they had ever experienced that. And, and it was a, a pleasant memory in their mind. And so here again we see the nation of Israel being something presented as something pleasing and, and something pleasant uh, to others. During the millennial kingdom, Israel will be held in high esteem by the Gentile nations of the world. The threats of destruction from other nations will be replaced with pleasant thoughts about the Jews. God will take away their reproach, and the Lord will be exalted in the sight of other nations. They observe Israel's prosperity under His blessings. With the Lord's abundant blessings, not only will the nation be materially prosperous, economically strong and enduring, it will be beautiful spiritually. And talk about the beauty of holiness. You know, some phrases. And... Um, I don't claim to understand all that that phrase means, but it's a, it's a good thing. And, and you know, we don't think about the, the wholeness of God being a beautiful thing, but it is. And, and uh, you know, when people live in holiness, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, it's a, an idea of thought. I don't think, I know it doesn't with me, hadn't really registered or thought about much, but the beauty of holiness. And that's what Israel will be at that time. And... Um, you know, uh, Israel today, they live under the threat, I think, of something hurtful or harmful going on every day. You know, you, you, I don't wonder what imagine what it would be like to live with the thought that, you know, today we might come under missile attack or today we might be under terrorist attack or, or all those type of things they live with constantly. And, and, you know, in the future, they'll not have to do that and uh, they'll not have to worry anymore. Verse 8, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? And uh, yeah, idolatry will never be a problem with Ephraim again. Here again, why was Ephraim chosen? You know, remember we talked about that being representative of the northern ten tribes, that term. Um, and the fact that that tribe often took leadership, sometimes in a bad way, often in a bad way, regarding uh, the Israel. 
um, the nation will never submit com completely to the Lord. The nation will submit completely to the Lord and never involve itself with false gods such as Baal or create images needed to worship God or some false god. You know, all that's going to be done away totally and completely. Israel will never rely on other nations about them, about them instead of the Lord. The nation's focus will be solely on the Lord. Ephraim will be truly fruitful unto God during the millennial kingdom. That's what the word Ephraim means, fruitful. And, and you know, they will be fruitful unto the Lord then. Instead of leading the rest of the tribes into idolatry, Ephraim will lead the others into bringing glory to God. Hosea's prophecy ends with an admonition to all who might hear or read what he said there in verse 9. It says, Who is wise, and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them? For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressor shall fall therein. You know, that last verse is just as relevant to us today as it was to those Israelites thousands of years ago. And, and what we take from this prophecy here, you know, if we're wise, you know, we're going to learn some things. If we're prudent, you know, we're going we're gonna to think about it. The individual who is truly wise, the idea there, the individual who's able to discern spiritually or spiritual truth, and the prudent, it says the individual who applies that truth to his or her life. In other words, the things Hosea has to said has said, you know, does it register in our minds and our hearts? You know, is it going to make? Are we going to make application in our lives? And uh, talk about the one who's uh, prudent, spiritual, or biblically, will understand and know what Hosea has declared. You know, the three principles that sum up the prophecy. First, the ways of the Lord are right. You know, everything God does, He's you know, He's holy and righteous. You know, Psalm one forty five seven tells us. There is no injustice with God. He is righteous in the administration of his judgments. I had a preacher the other day made this comment. I never thought about it before. He talks about people how people say, you know, that's not fair, that's not fair, that's not fair. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God is fair. But it does say in the Bible God is just. Amen. That's two different things. God always does what is right in situations. Always what's right. God never promises to be fair, but He promises to be just. Amen. And, and so that's the distinction that, that needs to be made. I never thought about that until I heard your preacher preaching on that here about a week or so ago. And so He is right. He is righteous. He is righteous in the administration of His blessings. You know, how God blesses people and how God deals with people, you know, you know He deals with me differently, does Bobby. He deals with me differently than he does Pastor Brian. But in everything in God's dealings with us, it is right. And it's right for us, and it's best for us. And, and it's the same way with every individual out here. And, and uh, because God is righteous, the truth of God's Word is, is the right way for people to order their lives. And so, here again, it's a matter of getting our minds and our hearts in alignment with, with God and, and believing that you know, God is doing what's right in my life. And, and for me. And then it says those that, that do that shall walk in them. You know, the just are the righteous. The righteous obey the word of the Lord. Now they're not righteous because they walk in the, in the word of the Lord. They walk in his ways because it's his way that aligns with who God is, has declared himself to be. And it's evidence of their faith and their desire to worship and serve God. You know, it's a, it's a you might say the, the result of them being uh, declared righteous by God. You know, their righteousness is, is a, the fruit of what God's done in their life. You know, it's not them trying to be righteous, it's the fact that they are righteous. And, and um, you know, often people try to get that backwards. And so, the just shall walk in them. They'll walk in the ways of the Lord. And then last, says the opposite, the transgressor shall fall therein. You know, God's ways are a stumbling block to transgressors. And pasha, it means the one who breaks away from just authority. You know, it's not just that he breaks away from authority, he breaks away from just authority, or right authority, in this case, God. And it says a rebel, a revolter, an offender, one who rejects God's authority. This is what the idea behind the term. 
Just like the northern Indian tribes rejected God and refused to obey Him. You know, that's what they were. They were a transgressor. This led to the nation's decline and to its destruction. This principle applies just as much to an individual as it did to the nation of Israel. You know, those who choose to rebel against God's authority and, and re refuse to, to follow God's way, you know, the end result will not be good, no matter what they think. So we conclude here with just a, some few thoughts and we'll be done with Hosea. So there are several truths seen in Hosea's prophecy. Uh, first, it comes to mind, sin that is not repented of deceives and it hardens and it ultimately destroys. I mean, we saw that with the ten, ten tribes, didn't we? They refused, they refused, they refused to turn back to God and, and their heart got harder and harder and harder and it ultimately resulted in their destruction. Next, nothing that man does is hidden from God's sight, including the motives for the actions taken. You remember, you know, the Israelites said, you know, we can do what we're going to do, and, and you know, who can blame us? Who can point their finger at us and say we're guilty? You know, God can. And uh, you know, man might not will, but, or can, but God will. And God can. And so we need to remember that. We see this. God, because He's loving and patient, gives the transgressors the opportunity to repent and turn to Him and avoid His judgment that will otherwise surely come upon them. And so, as we see with Hosea, you know, the Israelites were given many ch chances, many opportunities to return to the Lord. And then last, God blesses those that choose to repent of their transgression and by faith submit themselves to Him and obey His will for their lives. And we see this with, you know, what He says regarding Israel and what will happen in the future. Then a, then a, uh, to, to finish up, and I found this you know, in, a, in a book that uh, I was studying out of. It says, as far as God is concerned, there are two ways that rebellion against Him may be ended. It's going to end, but it's only in one, one of two ways. It may end with punishment, or it may end with the development of a loving relationship between Him and the former rebel. It's going to be one or the other. It's not going to be middle road. It's going to be one or the other. God's first step is to bring an indictment, you know, to say, you know, here's guilt, here's the reason why there's a problem, and to expose the evidence for the charge given sins. Didn't Hosea do that? He pointed out to those Israelites, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. Here's why you're guilty before me. And so here's that is evident, what God did. The response gives God desires from the guilty individuals is acknowledgement of the personal sin, repentance towards God, and a request for forgiveness and restoration to Him. The Lord would rather people repent of their rebellion and receive His forgiveness and cleansing and avoid the judgment that must come against all who refuse to submit to His ways. And then a little quote to finish up. Historically, Israel as a nation and as individuals knew God's acts of judgment and His acts of salvation. You know, their history was full of that. You know, and the prophets put that before them. You know, and so it wasn't something that was hidden to their sight. Man's rebellion was the cause of judgments, but God's compassion was the grounds for their salvation. And so, you know, a lot to be learned, I think, from Hosea, or a lot to be reminded to us, you know, from Hosea. And uh, so next time we'll begin looking at the little prophecy of Joel.